So hi, everyone, and welcome to our sixth Inspiration Exchange session. Uh, my name is Nick Maxfield. I handle the Van der Schaar Labs Communications, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm also joined by Mihaila Van der Schaar, who will be um, responsible for general oversight of this session and handling the Q&A. And we also have with us uh, two of our own Labs members, um, postdoc Ahmed Allah and PhD student James Jordan, who will be giving presentations and also answering your questions. And with us today as co-moderator is Alex Chan. Uh, so to give you an idea of what to expect from today's session, um, obviously, as usual, as many of you know, the ongoing aim of Inspiration Exchange is to share and exchange the breadth of topics um, in machine learning for healthcare and to generate new ideas for future research. And uh, we're kind of in the second half of a two-part mini-series on synthetic data. In the first half, um, last month, we introduced and defined synthetic data and showcased some of the possibilities related to our own labs projects. And this time round, we'll be building on what we did in our last session, but shifting focus a little bit to the evaluation of synthetic data. And more specifically, um, this, for example, involves examining some of the trade-offs between data set fidelity, suitability, and privacy, while also looking at some of these notions themselves. Um, so we do have some of the researchers uh, who will be giving the presentations available for the Q&A and discussion session um, once we finish with the presentations. And to break this down time-wise, um, I'll start with a five minute or so introductory video uh, by Mihaila. Um, she'll be sort of laying the groundwork for the session in general. And then we'll go into two presentations given by our lab members on our own labs projects related to evaluation of synthetic data. And after this, we'll go into the Q&A session, our open discussion on uh, these presentations or about evaluation of synthetic data in general. And we do um, strongly recommend that you ask any questions you come up with, because one of the purposes of this engagement series is to kind of build an, a community and come up with new ideas. Um, and then once we've done with the Q&A, uh, we'll wrap up with some closing words from me just before 5 p.m. Right, so first up, we have Mihaila's introductory video. Uh, as I said, this is about five minutes long. If you do have any questions, please post them into the Inspiration Exchange Slack channel. Um, if you're just joining us, the URL to join that workspace can be found in the previous emails I've sent about Inspiration Exchange. Anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, please let me play Mihaila's introductory video. Hello and welcome to the second Inspiration Exchange dedicated to synthetic data. Let me remind you, why do we need synthetic data? We all know that machine learning can catalyze a complete transformation in numerous domains, including healthcare. But machine learning researchers in this area are often hamstrung by lack of access to high quality data. And this is the result of perfectly valid concerns regarding the privacy of such sensitive data sets. It is our belief that synthetic data could offer a powerful solution to this problem. This is why in the last four years, we have introduced and developed the research agenda in synthetic data. Our lab has played a pioneering role in shaping the concepts regarding synthetic data. We envision the creation of an image net for synthetic data sets in the healthcare domain. I have envisioned the creation of a clearinghouse where data guardians can provide their sensitive data and we can generate synthetic data with high privacy and high quality guarantees. And the synthetic data can then be given to data users, machine learning researchers and developers who can train models, run competitions, do statistical research, thereby enabling a variety of new healthcare tools, which can then be provided back to the data guardians, hospitals, healthcare providers, patients, etc. This clearinghouse will have two distinct roles. The first is the generation of synthetic data. The second is assaying the quality of the generated synthetic data. We need to make sure that the data is generated with sufficient privacy guarantees. And in this way, the data guardians can feel confident that the data that is released to the data users is not going to violate 
their privacy concerns. We also need to make sure that data has high fidelity because the machine learning researchers that are developing their methods on the basis of this data need to feel confident that the data is of high quality and hence the methods they are developing on the basis of this data are going to be of high quality and they can indeed empower the data guardians. If you want to read more about this vision of an image net for synthetic healthcare data sets and that of a clearinghouse that can enable such synthetic data generation and assaying, please take a look at our website dedicated to this idea. You can also learn on the same website more about synthetic data. We are providing there a gentle introduction to the topic. Please take a look. In the last inspiration exchange, we have introduced a variety of state-of-the-art machine learning models for synthetic data generation developed over the last years in our lab. They are both synthetic data generation methods for static data as well as time series data. You can see the wealth of publications we have produced over the last years on synthetic data on our website dedicated to this topic. The software associated with this can be found on our group with GitHub. Today, we are going to discuss with you the NeoRIPS 2020 competition that we have developed for synthetic data generation. Our lab, together with Amsterdam University Medical Center and Microsoft Research Cambridge, has run a NeoRIPS 2020 competition that we called Hide and Seek Privacy Challenge. Today, James is going to tell you more about the design of this competition and the lessons we have learned from running it. And then Ahmed is going to talk to you about how we can better evaluate uh, and assess synthetic data and the lessons that we have learned from running the competition and which provide food for thought and practical solutions that we can use in running the next competition on synthetic data. Let us hear from them. Okay, so next up we have two presentations from our lab members and these are roughly 20 minutes in total. Again, I'd like to ask you to uh, post any questions that you have into the Inspiration Exchange channel on Slack. Um, the earlier the better, because if we see your question earlier, there's a higher likelihood that we'll actually get around to being able to answer it in the time we have available to us. Okay, so our first presentation is from James Jordan, one of our PhD students, and it's on the hide and seek privacy challenge that we ran as part of the NeurIPS 2020 competition track. Hello, I'm James Jordan. I'm going to talk now about our NeurIPS 2020 hide and seek privacy challenge. I'd like to start by pointing out that this competition wouldn't have been possible without the great support given to us by our collaborators, with Amsterdam UMC kindly providing high quality data for us to use and Microsoft Research providing us with compute and prizes. So the first thing is, adversaries exist in the real world, and I mean we know this. This is precisely why the idea of synthetic data, privacy, security, all of these things exist. And the first thing to note is that data can be misused. The purpose of synthetic data is to avoid the real data being misused by adversaries. By passing out the synthetic data, we can hope that the real data is not breached in any way and that the privacy of the individuals, the security of the individuals, is somehow maintained by passing out the synthetic data. Unfortunately, synthetic data can also be misused. If the synthetic data itself is not generated in a meaningful private way, then the synthetic data could be just as misusable as the real data. I suppose the first question is what does it mean for data to be synthetic? But that is a big question and I couldn't possibly discuss this fully in this presentation. So the important takeaway is that synthetic data can also be misused. Another thing to note about adversaries in the real world is that we cannot assume what their capabilities might be. This is critical because we can't know what their methods might be. We can't model all possible future attacks that might be carried out against our synthetic data. In addition, we cannot expect that the method, the algorithm that we use to generate the synthetic data will remain private. These two assumptions are fairly crucial. It might be the case that at one point in time, current methods aren't capable of breaching the security of the generated data, but future methods may be able to do so, either due to an improvement in the adversary's capabilities or because they gain knowledge of the algorithm we use to generate the data and knowing the algorithm allowed them to develop a targeted approach. As such, it is important that knowledge of the algorithm does not allow for a breach in privacy. 
such a brief breach would be catastrophic as data cannot be recalled from the public domain. To this end, our competition was two-tracked. We pitted data adversaries, seekers, against data generators, hiders. We had data generators generating synthetic data, and on the other side we had seekers attempting to identify which subset of the real data the hiders were using to generate their data. In terms of the two assumptions we can't make about adversaries, our seeker models were kept hidden from hiders, preventing hiders from simply trying to protect against known attacks. It was originally our goal that in the other direction, hider algorithms would be made available to seekers, so that seekers could create targeted attacks and the hiders would need to ensure that knowledge of the algorithm did not allow for a breach. Unfortunately, in the end, this was not practical in this iteration of the competition, but will certainly be implemented in future iterations. Defining the seeker task was actually fairly challenging. In the real world, seekers have access to a huge amount of data and resources that they can leverage from just about anywhere you can imagine. Many datasets exist that are public, and these public datasets can be used to, if you like, hack other private datasets or synthetic datasets generated on the basis of private datasets. On the other hand, competitions like this require clearly defined boundaries to create a fair challenge for all participants. It was particularly difficult to come up with a seeker task that both understood the fact that there may be external data available to the seekers and still make it fair for all seekers that participated in the challenge. In practice, identifying members that were used to create synthetic datasets will involve leveraging external datasets. Unfortunately, these external datasets muddy and complicate the competition design. If we wish to allow these external datasets to be usable, the seeker task itself would become uh, difficult to define. It may need to be static. That is, instead of them providing us an algorithm, we provide them some synthetic data and they would come back to us with an answer about the synthetic data. Or we would need to remove the human element by having their algorithm need to automatically ingest some external data set we give to it. In the end, we settled on asking seekers to identify which subset of a given data set was used to generate some synthetic data. So essentially what we do is we ask the generators to generate some synthetic data on the basis of some subset of the real data. We would then enlarge the real data using data from the large your original data set and pass both the enlarged data set and the synthetic data to the seekers. The seekers were then tasked with identifying the subset of the enlarged data set that was actually used to generate the synthetic data. I'll now talk about defining the HIDA task. The purpose of the competition is to understand the limitations of existing synthetic data generation models in a general setting. So although we do have a specific data set here in mind, we wanted models to work for more general data sets. And in this instance, we did not want models to work only for a specific instance of the given data set. As such, we saw an algorithm, not a synthetic data set or learned model, that could be used to generate synthetic data sets for a variety of subsets of the real data. As such, HIDA submissions were algorithms, not generated datasets. The synthetic data generated by HIDA algorithms must then accomplish two competing goals. The data must protect the privacy of the individuals used to generate it. To this end, HIDA algorithms were ranked according to how well they resisted seeker algorithms. The data must also accurately reflect the real data. To this end, HIDA algorithms were required to pass a minimum quality threshold. Algorithms that failed to pass were not ranked. With regards to evaluation, hiders were required to pass a minimum quality threshold involving two tasks. Leave one out feature prediction, which was performed for 10 features in the dataset, and one step ahead prediction. In both cases, the RMSE attained by training on synthetic data and then testing on real data was compared to the RMSE obtained by both training and testing on real data. In the competition, we required that hider models not have RMSE worse than five times that of the real data. Hiders and seekers were both then ranked according to their versus scores, i.e. the scores obtained by having seekers hack hiders. Hiders were ranked according to the seeker that performed best on their synthetic data, whereas seekers were ranked according to the mean score they obtained across qualifying hiders. The score itself is simply the percentage of correct guesses made by the seeker about which subset of the enlarged data was used to generate the synthetic data, which is given more formally by the equation on screen. While we believe the versus score created a meaningful competition, the evaluation of synthetic data quality was not particularly robust and is an area we hope to improve upon in future iterations by leveraging ideas from Ahmed's presentation. We provided four benchmarks to participants, two for each side of the competition. On the HIDA side, the first benchmark was a simple add noise model that takes the real data and adds Gaussian noise to it. The second is TimeGAN, a method developed by a group for time series data generation that combines generative adversarial networks with autoregressive models, training the GAN in a mixed adversarial and supervised manner, and that we presented at our last inspiration exchange. On the seeker side, 
we used a simple KNN model that selected the subset of the enlarged data that was closest to the generated data, and a binary predictor that was trained to distinguish synthetic data from the enlarged real data. The subset of the enlarged real data that was then most misclassified by the predictor was chosen as the predicted subset. Here we have an overview of the head-to-head -head nature of the competition. Thank you for listening. If you want to find out more, please do take a look at the proposal paper or the Code Lab website and get in touch if you have any further questions. Okay, and our second and last um, presentation is from Ahmed Allah, one of our lab's postdocs, and it's on metrics for evaluating generative models. Hi everyone, today I'll be discussing the issue of evaluating the quality of synthetic data and the performance of generative models. And the work that I'll be presenting today is joint work with Boris Van Bregel, Evgeny Savelyev, and Professor Van der Schaar. So generative models work in a very different way than our usual discriminative predictive models, uh, in the sense that they don't really make any predictions. So generative models create new data. They synthesize features or labels based on a training sample that they have been trained on. And while it's very easy to evaluate the performance of discriminative models simply by testing them on a held out training sample, uh, testing sample and evaluate their predictions, the same doesn't apply for generative models. You can, we cannot really straightforwardly say whether the brand new data that's generated by a generative model is good or bad. And there has been basically two schools of thought on how to evaluate generative models. The first relies on uh, domain-specific expert opinion or domain-specific scores, uh, like the inception score for image data that uses pre-trained representations uh, using the ImageNet network. And the other approach is based on statistical measures of divergence and likelihood. Uh, and while the likelihood function is domain agnostic and it can apply to various um, application domains, it has many problems. First of all, most state-of-the-art models like GANs and variational autoencoders do not really have a tractable uh, likelihood function. And also the likelihood can be hard to interpret. It can scale very badly with high dimensions. And uh, the likelihood is a single number that collapses different modes of failure of generative models into one number. It cannot really diagnose why generative models fail by just looking at a single likelihood uh, measure. So we introduce a new way to uh, view the performance of generative models at a three-dimensional space where we, in a very domain independent and domain agnostic way, um, we conceptualize the performance of uh, any generative model as a three-dimensional, a, a point in a three-dimensional space and where the first dimension represents the fidelity of the model, the second dimension represents the diversity of the samples created by the model, and the third dimension represents the authenticity of the samples created by the model. And by fidelity, we mean how is the quality of the samples that's generated by the model on average? Is the model generating noise or is it generating meaningful samples? And diversity is a measure of how um, the samples generated by the model cover the variance of samples in real data. So is it generating the same kind of samples again and again, or is it creating a diverse set of samples? And authenticity is a measure of the extent to which the model is actually copying the training data. So we would like our generative model to be inventing data rather than just resampling the data that it has seen in the training set. In order to quantify the fidelity quality of a generative model, we introduce a precision metric that quantifies uh, the rate by which the generative model uh, creates high quality samples. And the way we define the precision metric is as follows. So we look at the synthetic samples that the generative model has created, and then we count the fraction of these samples that reside within the alpha support of the real data distribution. And the alpha support is a subset of the entire support of the real distribution uh, that has uh, the most concentrated alpha fraction of the real data. So if we have a Gaussian distribution as shown in this figure, the alpha support would be uh, a subset of the entire support of the Gaussian distribution that is concentrated around, around the mean. And by varying this alpha from zero to one, 
we get um, an entire curve of precision rather than a single number. Uh, and for an optimal model that uh, perfectly creates high quality samples uh, that exactly re resemble the real data distribution, uh, then we will get uh, a perfect straight line for the for this alpha precision curve. But then if we have an imperfect model that either creates noise or creates uh, samples that are of high quality, but they are uh, having a mode shift or a mode collapse, then we will get a deviation from this straight line. And if you measure the area between the optimal and the achieved alpha precision curve, then this can be a single number that quantifies the fidelity of the model. And similarly, for the diversity of the model, we uh, introduce a metric called beta recall. And uh, this is a very similar definition, but flipping the real and synthetic distribution. So this is a measure of the fraction of the real data that is covered by the beta support uh, of the synthetic distribution. And again, if uh, the two models are exactly identical, meaning that the synthetic distribution exactly coincides with the real distribution, then the, the beta recall would be a straight line. Otherwise, it will deviate from that straight line and there will be uh, and a um, certain uh, error between the two curves that can quantify the model's diversity. Uh, so uh, the difference between these measures and the standard definitions of precision and recall is that they take into account the distributions of synthetic and real data and not just the supports. So if we define um, the precision and recall using uh, simply whether a sample resides in the support of the gen of the synthetic distribution or the real distribution as the conventional definition, then the two distributions that we have in this figure would have perfect recall and perfect precision. Uh, but they're actually very different distributions because there is a mode shift. So the synthetic distribution is generating, concentrating its data around number zero. It's not generating enough two and three and other numbers, even though it generates them with some probability. And if we just count the number of samples that are uh, of high quality or the number of samples that are covered with some probability by the generator model, then we can get perfect precision and recall metrics, even if the, even though the distributions may be arbitrarily different between the real and generator model. Uh, and by using this beta recall and alpha precision metrics, we incorporate the effects of distributional shift, including like mode collapse, mode invention, uh, or mode shifts that th these things can be diagnosed with our metrics and cannot be diagnosed by the conventional measures of precision and recall. It can be very hard to estimate the support of a distribution, um, let alone the beta support or the alpha support. So to do this, we use a one class neural network that takes, uh, uh, converts the real data into uh, a new feature space in the form of a hypersphere. So it basically, tries to find the learning manifold that is shaped as a hypersphere, where most samples concentrate around the center of the hypersphere. And then the beta support and the alpha support would be just uh, the radius of the hypersphere that contains alpha percentage of the data or beta percentage of the data. And um, basically, we train this one class neural network on the data in order to estimate the supports. And then once we estimate the supports, we can uh, estimate the alpha precision and beta recall as defined in the previous slides. The last dimension of the evaluation metric is authenticity. And this is a measure of the rate in which the model copies uh, the training data or actually invents like brand new samples. Uh, and the reason this is, a very, this is very important because you can have a model that has perfect precision, perfect recall, but it's actually not sampling any new data. It's just resampling the training data. Uh, and that's a model that didn't learn anything. It just memorizes the data uh, it was given. And for many applications, like healthcare applications, this can cause uh, violations of patient privacy, for instance, because you can look at synthetic data set and you can identify real samples uh, in this data set. And the way we define authenticity, it's uh, the number of real sa synthetic samples that are closer to the real training data than all other real training points. Uh, and we show that this definition corresponds to a likelihood ratio test uh, of data copying. So because all of these metrics that we just introduced uh, can be computed on a sample level, meaning that we can judge the quality of individual synthetic samples 
uh, whether individual real samples are covered by the generative model and whether individual synthetic samples are authentic. Uh, all of the three dimensions of our metric are interpretable probabilistic quantities. They're just like accuracy for discriminative models. They represent the rates by which the model makes certain types of error. But not only this, the fact that we can judge the individual uh, quality of individual samples inspires a new use case, which we call post hoc auditing. This means that we can look at the generative model, create a synthetic sample, a synthetic data set uh, from that model, and then trim off the bad samples from that model. We're just looking at samples that are not precise uh, and samples that are not authentic. And this can improve the overall quality of the model uh, in a post hoc fashion without us really making any changes to the modeling choices or without even uh, needing to understand how the model works. We can just look at the synthetic data set, look at the training data set, and compute these sample level metrics for each synthetic sample and then remove the bad sample. Uh, so finally, we apply these metrics to the hide and seek competition. And uh, by looking at this fuller picture of performance, by looking at the precision, recall, and authenticity metric, we get a better idea of not only how the different models perform in terms of predictive accuracy uh, on some testing data, uh, but also how the different models fail in terms of these three dimensions. And it was very surprising that the winner model in this competition uh, was a very simple model that adds noise to the training data to create new synthetic samples. Uh, but that's because we are evaluating these models in terms of the predictive accuracy. But if we look at this fuller picture of looking at precision, recall, and authenticity, we find that this model performs competitively in terms of precision and recall. But as one might expect, because it's just adding noise to the training data, it's, it's highly unauthentic. It's not really inventing new samples. So in practice, if we are going to actually deploy one of these models to create synthetic medical data, uh, even though this model performed, um, came, out, came out as the best performing model in terms of predictive performance, it's actually not very good in terms of patient privacy. This highlights the importance of looking at this multidimensional uh, evaluation metrics. And thank you for listening. Okay, so now it's time for our Q&A session, and I think we're doing quite well schedule-wise. Um, I think most of you by now will know the rules, but just to kind of refresh them, um, please post your questions into the Slack chat in the Inspiration Exchange channel. I think we already have about four or so lined up at the moment, which is great, but we can, um, I think with the amount of time we have, we can probably take a couple more, which would be great as well. Um, so uh, if we choose your question, we'll ask you to unmute yourself. And then um, please just ask your question, uh, probably best to specify which of the presentations it refers to, if it refers to any specific presentation. And we would like to ask you, if possible, to limit your questions to one minute per question so that we can allow about two minutes per question and answer in total and hopefully get through as many of these as possible in the time we have. And then uh, please do remember to remute yourself uh, when you've asked your question so we don't continue to hear you in the background. Um, Right, so I believe our first question is from Andrew Bard, um, and it is for James. Um, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, hi, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm kind of interested in whether you plan to uh, run your experiment, but using teams of real hiders and seekers. Uh, so I'm envisioning kind of a Kaggle style competition in which you literally have people trying to outdo each other in order to optimize both algorithms. Is that on the cards? So um, thanks for the question. I guess I have a question back for you by what do you mean by real? So in our New Europe's competition, you know, these teams are people um, sort of submitting their algorithms and, uh, you know, they're going against each other in a real way where their algorithms are generating data and the seekers are being tasked with uh, like hacking that data. Uh, can you not unmute yourself again? Is that? Hang on. Sorry. I think uh, it was probably a result of my request to um, 
Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, actually, he cannot. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Sorry. Yes, I clearly had misunderstood that. Um, I, I, I got the impression from your talk that uh, that you'd kind of uh, assembled panels of algorithms to to perform that rather. Right. Than... No, no. So the, the the goal of the competition was precisely what you're envisioning, I guess, where we had real people developing algorithms to create synthetic data for a given data set. In this case, Amsterdam UMC, and then real teams of seekers trying to develop you know methods to hack these these generated data sets oh cool i mean i th i think that's a really great that's a really great way of of running things um would you be interested in kind of op opening that up to the public then yeah, so we do have plans to continue. We do have plans for a future competition, which should be coming soon. Um, you know, we learned a lot of lessons from the original competition, and we hope that this time we'll come back with a really strong competition that should be really interesting for anyone who wants to get involved. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think our second question is from Amir and for uh, James, I believe. So please uh, go ahead, Amir. Hi. Um, so I guess I, my question is a follow-up for Andrew's uh, question. So what were the key challenges associated with running such a two-sided uh, competition? Yeah, so in general, um, the like a two-sided competition is not something that's really been done that much before. Um, if you look on Code Lab or any of the you know popular competition websites on Europe's competitions of the past, a lot of them are all focused on a single task with a single goal, and you know sort of there's a good framework around that to to do so. But um, having this two-sided competition where your score depends on how well the other side is also doing, and um, prevented so uh, presented some implementation challenges, um, which perhaps Evgeny can talk about in a second. Um, on the other side of things, though, as well, with the two-track competition, sort of the success of the whole competition depends on both sides getting getting submissions and both sides sort of getting up and running. So um, in particular, in the iteration that we ran through for the New Europe's competition, we uh, sort of unfortunately didn't quite realize that um, the way we'd set up the competition encouraged hiders to submit their algorithms as late as possible, because the later they submitted them, the less time anyone had to hack them. Um, and so it's these kind of like nuances, I guess, of, of the two-sided competition where you need people to be submitting early so that both sides have a fair chance to then sort of unravel and hack and undo whatever the other side's doing. Um, and so, you know, in future, in the future competition, we're going to have a more staged approach where, you know, people need to submit by a certain time. And then the next sort of stage of the competition will be hacking the previous stages, uh, like submissions. And that was like a particularly challenging thing um, to sort of motivate people to actually submit because as I say, they, they weren't necessarily, uh, like it wasn't necessarily good for them to do so. But perhaps Evgeny could also talk about some of the technical challenges. Uh, Evgeny, do you have, uh, is there anything you can add? Um, I think there's uh, the, the same question from Alicia uh, as well, but I can answer it now, I suppose. Um, so, um, the there were a few challenges in terms of running this um, competition from the implementation standpoint. Um, so firstly, Coda Lab, which was the, the, the platform that we used, which is probably the, the the most sophisticated one in terms of customizability. Um, certainly, it allows a lot more things than just Kaggle, for example. Uh, it's still not well adapted for this two-sided competition, so we had to. Um, uh, in, well, write a lot of custom code. Uh, um, uh, another thing here was that so different different models uh, submitted by different teams obviously can have some very different dependency sets. Um, so we're assuming everything runs in Python and, and uh, it's various Python library dependencies. But um, what that meant was we had to kind of work with Docker, Docker's SDK or Docker's API for people to actually be able to um, run their, uh, their code with the particular dependencies that they want, which is not the most common thing to do. So that, that took quite a bit of effort to implement. Um, another big challenge and then another side from our side perhaps there was just the time that uh, each execution of each submission would take to run because, um, in essence, after each hider submission is uh, provided, it needs to then be evaluated against all seekers. 
and vice versa. And given that the data set involved was quite large, this could take a very, very long amount of time. And uh, it didn't present the competitors or the, the teams with kind of the easiest environment to debug because they have to wait for a very long time uh, after submitting their, um, their solution for function results and and these are all various implementation issues we are planning to address in a future implementation of the of the next version of the competition great thanks james and evgeny um so i think our next question is from uh laura and laura i think you asked two questions actually but if the if for the moment um you wouldn't mind just going with the first of your two um, which I think is probably a good one for both uh, James and Ahmed to handle from different perspectives, maybe. And then we'll get to your second question um, shortly after. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so my first question is um, kind of about whether through either the hide and seek competition or any other experiments, you had looked at whether there's any correlation between differential privacy parameters and how well the model fares against privacy attacks in in practice um yep. yeah 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 thanks for the question so um the short answer is mostly no um the much longer answer is that uh sort of i mean differential privacy provably protects against certain types of of privacy attacks like membership inference to a certain degree um one thing that we had hoped to do with the competition was investigate precisely this sort of um you know uh pit potentially notions of differential privacy if that's what the teams that were submitting chose to do so and we did expect some teams to do so um against you know seeker models that people could actually come up with in the real world so uh you know differential privacy is a worst case bound uh on sort of what could happen um and it's you know i guess the the, the hope of the competition was that maybe we could find out just how far from this worst case bound current methods and current thinking might be um Unfortunately, you know, we had some some setbacks in the competition, and uh, like now going forward, we very much hope that this this next competition will will sort of shed light on on many questions like this. Okay, um, and I think next up uh, we have Kai Shu, and I believe this question is probably best addressed to Ahmed. Um, please go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just curious how exactly was the network to estimate the distribution support got trend? Yeah, thank you for this question. So, of course, if you want to estimate these alpha supports from the raw data, that would be very hard because you can have like multiple modes and the definition of the alpha support would be uh, very complicated mathematically to just directly apply to the, to the raw data. So, the mm -hmm. one class your network is uh, is actually an outlier detection network that tries to enclose the entire data into a hypersphere. So it, it does a feature transformation to transform yeah. the raw data distribution into something that's as close as possible to a unimodal distribution in which most data points are concentrated around the center of the hypersphere. And then the support of the data would be a hypersphere in some d-dimensional space. And this is trained with a loss function that uh, tries to minimize the distances between the transformed feature points and the center of the hypersphere and the regularization term, which is the radius of this hypersphere. So it's basically trying to find the smallest hypersphere that can contain all the data points. And once we do this, and once the support looks like a hypersphere, the alpha support would be approximated as uh, subsets of this sphere. So if you want the alpha support of the distribution, we can take uh, a, a sub hypersphere of the, of the entire hypersphere that has alpha fraction of the data. So that's uh, how we use this uh, one class neural network. I see, that's, that's clear, thanks. Okay, um, so I think it's actually, it's back to Laura again. Um, Laura, please go ahead with your second question, um, which I think is also for Ahmed mainly. Yes, yeah, so this question um, is kind of about um, multiple releases of synthetic data based on the same underlying data set. So I was wondering if um, any of the team had kind of evaluated these risks to privacy and how multiple releases might kind of build up 
increased risk? Yeah, thank you for this question. I think this is a very good question. It's something that will um, maybe overlooked by somebody who's just writing a paper about the, these kinds of methods. But in practice, if we are releasing like many data sets to many different uh, research groups, for instance, based on the same training data, there will be always a risk of somebody like aggregating these different data sets and making inferences about the real data. So the way we um, can quantify the risk and also eliminate the risk is using this authenticity metric. So uh, if you if we keep track of all the data sets that we have released, we can compute the sample level authenticity of each released data point across multiple data sets that we have released, and then identify the vulnerable real data points that may have uh, that may have been possibly revealed by having this aggregate set of data sets. And this is the auditing um, this is the the value of the auditing part of our uh, algorithm, where before releasing any individual data set, we are actually moving the potentially exposed data points within each individual uh, data set. So I think we can quantify the risk of having any data point exposed using this authenticity metric. We can also eliminate uh, proactively like remove the data points that are potentially can be identified from the real data before releasing the data to any individual uh, entity. And if we do this for all, each individual data set, then the aggregate data set should also be safe because we are applying sample level control on what data we release. But that we can we can definitely like make further investigation how this correlates with differential privacy and things like this. We haven't done this uh, kind of analysis yet, but I, I imagine that with the authenticity metric we can uh, both quantify and control the risk. Okay, great. That sounds really interesting. Thanks. Okay, so I think uh, we have a couple more questions lined up. We do have time for a few more if we do get them, but. Um, Anyway, next up, we have uh, Jim Smith. Uh, please go ahead. And I think this one's probably best addressed to Ahmed. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so you talked about a little bit already last questions. Uh, so this authenticity metric uh, was low for the uh, method to just add noise to the original data points, but that was also the winner in terms of predictive uh, performance. So when it is true, I thought like, have you thought of any uh, threshold which authenticity is acceptable in terms of privacy issues? Uh, and if that is, is the case, then maybe the noise is the best way to uh, generate uh, generate synthetic data. So have you thought of like what's yeah. acceptable? Yeah, so um, I think the this is a, uh, like the authenticity metric is a very, it's like a fundamental measure of data point identifiability. But then when we want to select a threshold on authenticity, because it will never be zero naturally from any model. Uh, sorry, it will never be 100% for any model. Uh, we can, on the training data, correlate different levels of authenticity with another parameter that is more domain specific. So if differential privacy is the sensible metric of privacy preservation in a certain application, uh, we can just measure the correlation between different levels of authenticity and differential privacy and transfer like uh, a threshold on differential privacy to a threshold on authenticity. Um, in other applications, maybe differential privacy is not the right metric, but there is something else. So I think like authenticity itself, the, the absolute value of authenticity is not having a universally acceptable threshold across all possible applications that you may look at, but it correlates with, with possibly all the measures of privacy that you can imagine. So. I think we need to have an like uh, augment our analysis with another practical measure of privacy that's relevant to the application and transfer this to um, a threshold on authenticity. Uh, and yeah, regarding adding noise as like possibly the best way to generate data, I think that this this is just would be the case for applications where you want training data for machine learning models. If you just perturb training data. Uh, many times you get many possible data sets and then you train machine learning models on them this may work well but if you're actually generating time series data that has uh, very long-term dependencies or you have you're generating images or you're generating clinical notes adding noise really doesn't make it won't make you any good because that's uh, that's these are problems where the learning manifold is is, uh, is not 
at all related to the like is not trivially observed in the raw data. So I don't think this is this would hold uh, in any other task other than just creating training data for machine learning models. Okay, thanks, Ahmed. Um, I think our final question is from Haosun, who I think made an earnest effort to post it into Slack, but didn't manage due to technical issues. Um, so yeah, please go ahead, Haosun. And I think this is for both of our presenters. Sorry, Halson, can you um, unmute yourself or accept my request to unmute? If not, I can, um, I can ask your question for you. Uh, yes, uh, thanks. So my question is uh, maybe for both James and uh, Amd. So the question is, is there a possibility to generate scientific data uh, like through testing the physics laws uh, of like, uh, for example, we can generate the uh, spin configurations of Isaac model and then test the physics laws of those generated data. And uh, can we just evaluate the authenticity of those data by, uh, by through, through this method? So I guess um, sort of uh, the, the thing is when you have like known laws, uh, known, known structure for your data, you should try your best to try and like you know incorporate this into your generative model anyway. It might not be best to say you know try and just train a, a standard GAN to to generate scientific data. Um, there's obviously a lot of uh, work in things like graph neural networks that would allow you to impose some sort of potentially causal structure on on the data and how you generate it. Um, that said, this is like like a, a potentially interesting point where you know you could argue about for testing certain generative models by, um, as you say, generating things with a known structure, not letting the model know the known structure, and then seeing if that known structure is, is sort of picked up somehow by the generative model. Um, of course, like a, a pretty big failure case here would be the fact that um, just because, you know, the generative model works on a specific instance of data or a specific field or domain of data does not mean that it's going to work well elsewhere. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Ahmed. Uh, yeah, I think. It. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, also, regarding your authenticity point, I think that authenticity is really about um, it, it's more relevant in applications where you need to invent new data. But if you are modeling any physical process that has that is actually following deterministic rules, then it, the authenticity is also only be relevant if there is noise in this physical process that you also want to capture. And you can still use our metric to measure that. But um, in general, if you are trying to infer physical rules from a physical process, it's more likely to be more deterministic. So maybe also this would be a less relevant evaluation dimension in this case. Yes, I see your point. But I also believe that uh, there are some stochastic physics process. And um, moreover, I think such physical laws can be used to uh, like evaluate the metrics you use to evaluate GANs and other generative models. Uh, like, can we do uh, similar things? Like evaluate metrics. Evaluate metrics? Yes. Like the, the metrics you used in, evaluate, in evaluating GANs and other general models. Can we use uh, like physics laws to uh, evaluate those metrics? Yeah, you mean like you are building a simulator for a physical process and you want to see whether it's good or, or not? Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. So even if it's the process is stochastic, as you mentioned, this means it has a, a certain support of densities. Um, and it, and yes. so it's still a probabilistic model. And this is just one, another, one other type of data. And you can still apply all these metrics perfectly. OK, thanks. Okay, uh, we actually just got a question in, like right now from um, Flynn. Um, so I think, shall we just try and take this one live and work out who should answer it? Um, sort of on the fly. Um, 
sorry, Flynn, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks. Uh, sure, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, so the first question I think is probably best to James. Um, uh, in your talk, you said that you'd underestimated how difficult the Seeker's task was. And while I think the results of the Seeker's task obviously show it was difficult, um, on the surface, it seems that a task where you give the Seeker's access to all of the real data um, is probably far easier than what a attacker in real life would do. So I wonder if you could elaborate on what you think made it so difficult. Yeah, sure. That's that's very fair. So the, I think the key difficulty in the seeker task essentially was that um, sort of, it's uh, an area that's probably underexplored because it's for the most part a negative use case for machine learning, if you like. And obviously, uh, in general, the machine learning community, we like doing positive things. We like doing things that are going to help people. And to some extent, this idea of hacking and inference attacks and things like that is not an area of uh, like machine learning that will be well explored by the sort of academic side potentially of, of machine learners. Um, and so the, the sort of the space of models out there actually is really quite underdeveloped. Um, uh, there's not much out there to like even go on. And then throwing in the fact that this data is time series means that the uh, seekers were tasked with something that is like somewhat underexplored and also in a time series setting where they have like a high volume of data and they're maybe just not quite sure how best to process it. Um, and so uh, like, what I meant was not so much that the task is any harder or easier than what the real world attackers might get, but just that the, um, like as an academic question, this is uh, like a difficult thing to sort of wade into as maybe your first experience of how do I, you know, invert this synthetic data generation model. Uh, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess also their task depended on how good the hiders did. And if the hiders didn't do very well, then trying to seek in not very good results would be yep. more difficult. Uh, so I guess I'll go on to my other question, um, which is uh, whether you think that measures based on membership inference attacks are the right kind of privacy measure to use. Um, I imagine for a lot of people, um, sort of value disclosures, kind of disclose, uh, disclosing specific values, the data about their real data would be the most concerning sort of yep. uh, privacy breaches. And those are still possible even um, when membership inference attacks have failed. So I'm wondering if maybe a metric that kind of affects or uh, that measures the risk of those kind of attacks could be more appropriate. Yeah, so um, I mean, the topic of privacy is, is absolutely huge and it's a very difficult question to answer with a single metric. Um, with regards to membership inference versus value disclosures, uh, one thing to think about that really motivated differential privacy in the first place was the fact that value disclosure is something that can happen whether you're in the data set or not, in the sense that um, you know, if you have rich enough data and you have, say, all but one feature about a person and your data allows you to build a strong enough predictive model that you can then predict that final feature of the person really well, that person didn't need to be in that data set to um, allow you to learn this additional value of the person. Um, and so, uh, like, it's, I guess, the, the, the most difficult thing about privacy in, in the real world is this difficult uh, idea of like linking intuition and notions that we think like yeah these make sense in words with mathematical notions that make sense when you actually think about what sort of can and can't happen um, and that's not to say that value disclosure is not something we could think about but that already that example I just gave makes it difficult to mean well what does it mean to be private in a setting where you want to keep something that's easily predictable from your other things that are out there private um, and things like that so that's sort of you know membership inference uh, and differential privacy which is sort of fairly related to membership inference sort of born out of these ideas of well what can we actually do because trying to keep people's values disclosed is uh, not undisclosed sorry is like quite a difficult task even when they're not in the data set okay um so i think that's pretty much all the questions that we have uh, just before we uh just before i wrap up i think we have a couple of words from Mihaila as well um Hello, if you want to come on and unmute. 
Yes, so I want to thank everyone for being part of this inspiration exchange. And I hope that everyone who is interested in developing machine learning methods for healthcare can hopefully join us in thinking about high quality ways to generate synthetic data on the basis of the real healthcare data. Only if we as a community that is interested in developing analytics in healthcare, only if we come together and develop solid solutions for privacy, for synthetic data generation, when we are able to do that with high quality, high fidelity and high privacy, only then we are hopefully going to unlock the availability of these different data sets, which will enable us as a community to develop better methods, to compare our methods on the same type of data and bring the whole research forward. So we really hope that you will join us in both generating synthetic data and coming up with methods for generating synthetic data, as well as evaluating synthetic data. And finally, if you are uh, owning or an owner of a particular um, high quality healthcare data set, again, we would like you to come forward and uh, maybe provide this data set to be used in a subsequent competition. If you are interested in participating in subsequent competitions, such as the one we have just run at NeurIPS 2020, please keep um, in touch with us. We are going to hopefully announce a new competition in this area shortly. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think that's pretty much all the Oh, we have time for uh, this time since it's nearly five. Uh, but before I go, uh, just let me tell you a little bit about our next session. Um, so our seventh Inspiration Exchange session will be on March 30th um, at 4 p.m. UK time. Um, and in this session, uh, instead of doing these sort of um, mini series on specific topics, this time we'll be covering a, a fairly wide range of brand new and exciting machine learning for healthcare projects that our lab has been working on recently. Um, another quick note as well, we are uh, recruiting PhD students and we do have a handful of fully funded positions that are set to start in autumn this year. Um, if you are interested, please uh, visit our site. You can see the URL specifically for um, PhD student applications on this slide here. Uh, other than that, uh, you can keep up to date with these Inspiration Exchange sessions um, by visiting our dedicated uh, page for these sessions and also, of course, by the emails and Slack notifications that I send periodically. Um, this session itself will be on YouTube in just a couple of days as well. Um, also, if you do have any friends or colleagues that might be interested in these sessions, please do let them know and uh, please do so by sharing the URL that you can see here on this slide. Other than that, um, thank you very, very much indeed for joining us and thanks for your questions. Um, please take care, stay safe, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all again in March. Thank you very much.